Hello and welcome to the Transfers Podcast, powered by footballtransfers.com. New podcast where we aim to bring you the news before it becomes news, as well as insight and analysis on that most important of the least important things, football. I'm Duncan Castles and I'm joined this week by someone who I like to think of as the best man of football journalism. Sunday Times football correspondent, author of four fine books on the sport, one of which we will talk about later in the show, and father now of a very young footballer of the year, Jonathan (laughs) Northcroft. (laughs) You've um, left the most important accomplishment to last. Yes, uh, Ode and Wigston under nines. Is uh, if you get a ticket to watch them, they've got a great young centre half, under nine look- girls, I should say. I'm looking forward to it and uh, seeing just how dirty she is compared to her father. <laughs> hard, hard but fair, as always. <laughs> great, great to have you on the podcast, Jonathan. Um, I think we start today um, by something which we, which I've heard described before by a. Uh, a, a good friend of ours, um, Ian McGarry, is the, the managerial magic roundabout. And I think <laughs> this, this, this summer we've got a particularly um, perplexing and uh, an amusing one. Um, in this past week, we have seen two Premier League clubs uh, get rid of their coaches by mutual consent. Uh, Maurizio Pochettino leaving Chelsea after a club review and Roberto De Zerbi uh, leaving Brighton and Hove Albion, which I think surprised some people, but I don't think we surprised people who knew the extent of conflict between the Zerbi and the ownership of the club over transfers. Um, we can start here with a news line which, about Pochettino, which is that we understand that Pochettino is not at all unhappy to be leaving Chelsea. Um, that he has found the working under the American ownership there particularly difficult, has been unimpressed um, with the quality of players provided to him and particularly the age structure and experience structure of the squad um, with the difficulties of keeping players fit. Uh, Chelsea had the, the, the worst player availability record in the Premier League this past season despite not playing European football. And um, and something that he'd been hinting about in recent weeks that whatever uh, the Americans decided about his future, he might decide to leave of his own accord. So what next for Pochettino? Well, one of the options open to him, and I think this will come as a surprise to the listeners, is the Saudi Arabian Pro League. And that's not simply because the Saudi Arabians are interested in a a coach of his stature, of trying to tempt him with a large amount of uh, cash, as they have with other coaches so far. It's also because Pochettino has an interest, a strong interest in moving to the league. He's discussed it with friends. Um, In December, he talked about the Saudi Pro League, what he thought of it. He said, I think it's good in football for players and for coaches also and for the business that is football. Um, So he's marked his interest there. And there are definitely going to be opportunities at the top end of the Pro League this summer. Um, The four... PIF clubs run by Saudi Arabia's Sovereign Wealth Fund all have issues. Um, Al Nasser, Cristiano Ronaldo's club, trail the champions Al Hilal by 12 points and Cristiano isn't particularly happy that he's been there 18 months and hasn't won a title yet. Uh, Marcelo Gallardo, uh, last season's champions, Al Itihad has had a, had a disastrous season finishing fifth place and won't qualify for the Asian Champions League. Even, even the coach of of Al Hilal, uh, the champions who are who are unbeaten in the league at present, um, is under a degree of pressure because he got knocked out. Um, this is George Jesus got knocked out of the Asian Champions League at the semi-final stage against far less well-resourced opposition. There are, of course, jobs open in Europe as well. And I guess my question to you, Johnny, is: with Pochettino winning his last five games to get Chelsea back into Europe. And the general perception being that, oh, well, he's not done a bad job after all and he's got things heading in the right direction. And with, with Bayern Munich looking for a coach, with Barcelona looking for a coach and Manchester United certainly considering 
about changing a coach. Has the amiable Argentine timed his exit perfectly? Uh, yes. I mean, that's very much my thought that, um, as you say, Duncan, he's not unhappy to be leaving Chelsea at this particular time for the reasons you've stated. Um, and I think part of that happiness might be the fact that um, this is the this is this is when the market is at its strongest now for managers. It's, this is an unprecedented time where so many big opportunities are there, and he does leave as a hot prospect um, again. You know, I think I think that the story of Poch at, at Chelsea um, was a, a was was one of restoring his reputation for me. When you consider that he came out of uh, PSG with a sort of mixed mixed view of him, um, managed not to win a league in, in, in his first uh, part of his, his reign and, and obviously did afterwards, but underperformed in the Champions League and there was a feeling that other coaches were starting to eclipse him. He didn't get the Manchester United job um, at that time and was being passed over for other jobs. I think that what he's done at Chelsea has 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 refreshed that reputation that he forged at Tottenham, which was of a guy who could take a young squad, develop players, create a strong identity, work against the odds, do so with a smile, and produce some pretty exciting football out of it. Now, all of that came together in the final few weeks, but if you listen to Chelsea fans, who didn't start off as Pochettino fans by any means because of his Tottenham links um, they were they, they were one round to him by the end and were really excited by the end of the season which is which is some achievement on his part so Bayern Munich's a very interesting one Poch was on their list in 2019 when he was um, when he was sacked by Spurs he didn't he didn't get the job then but it's the same hierarchy more or less at Bayern um They've got Max Abrell as a, as a sporting director now, but, but it's the same people on top, and I'm sure he will be of interest to them. And of course, their star player now is a certain Harry Kane, who I've visited Munich in the last few months. It's Harry Kane's club now. It's Harry Kane mania there. And, um, you know, he was able to bring in a central defender to the club. He might be able to um, influence the choice of manager. But actually... That be, a, I think, Poch would be a great choice for Bayern. He really would, and and he'd be very good for for the star player. Well, look, there was a school of thought that Pochettino would bring Harry Kane back to England after one year in Germany and and bring him to Chelsea as the striker. So that relationship's definitely there. Very strong relationship, um, and a, a sort of a loyalty between them, really, because you have to wind back and remember that Harry Kane was. Um, undervalued and almost discarded as a young player at, at, at Tottenham. They weren't sure about him. And it was under Poch that he turned into the, the phenomenon that he is. And Poch's man, management is very relationship-based, very human-centred, mm. and very important on a personal level to, to Kane's journey. I'm sure he would love to, to have him um, as his boss again. Now, now, Bayern have got themselves into an incredible mess over appointing a coach. I think they've gone through at least five candidates now and been rejected. Xabi, Alon Xabi Alonso was, a, was the obvious one. He, he's the coach who everyone in European football is trying to get at present and he made a, a deliberate decision to stay in Germany another year. There, there, there was a... a a belief, I think, on Bayern's part, or at least a belief expre expressed to the media, that Xabi, if he did leave Leverkusen, wanted to go to Munich. My understanding was he never considered that, and in fact felt if he was he, the option was to stay in Germany with the same club or to move elsewhere. But they lost out on Alonso, and I don't think they will get Alonso down the line. They then went to Julian Nagelsmann, um, who they placed a guardling leave a year ago, and asked him to to come back into the position in place of Thomas Tuchel. He turned them down. Um, they had a conversation with Thomas Tuchel, who they've decided to sack, and asked him if, if he'd change his mind about it, and he didn't. Um, they went to Ralph Radnick, who uh, I think if you've watched a lot of English football, 
you would be would find a, a bizarre appointment for for Bayern Munich, and then went to Crystal Palace and and tried to get Oliver Glasner, who who has made a really good start um, at Crystal Palace, out of there, and have so far failed um, to uh, get any terms agreed with the club. Um, they are now, uh, and I can confirm this on the transfers podcast. They are now talking to Vincent Company and asking a coach who has um, impressively taken Burnley up to to the Premier League in his, his first campaign um, uh, as manager there, but then just going straight back down again. And in one, I, I would say, one of the weakest Premier Leagues for a long time in terms of the relegation battle with just 24 points. Um, what, what are your thoughts on, on Vincent Company as an option for Bayern Munich and, and, and the idea that Bayern Munich are looking at a coach um, who's just been relegated from the Premier League. Yeah, that astonishes me if I'm being honest. I mean, he also spent £100 million in the summer uh, to make Burnley worse, arguably. Look, it, it, I don't want to dismiss Vincent Company as a, mm-hmm. as a coaching prospect. I think he showed in his first phase at, at, at Burnley that there is a real prospect there. And and he got them playing um, Pep style football. Uh, he he added value to um, a lot of young players. He created a really good team. But what we saw this year was a guy that still got a lot to learn, and he didn't adjust. Um, he didn't adjust his. I was going to say he didn't adjust his playing style. It's not so much that the playing philosophy was wrong. It's it's that he didn't adjust the fact that the players weren't good enough to. To actually play it, um, they got caught again and again making the same mistakes. Bad build-up structure, bad individual errors, um, just poorly poor technical errors, pass, passing the ball out. And in that situation, you've either got to coach the players to do better and coach the team to do different things uh, while retaining the same philosophy, or you do what Thomas Frank did at Brentford, which was to understand that this, his squad wasn't good enough to to play the style of football that he played in the championship when he went up and, and change the style. And that's, I think it's incumbent on any manager to do that. Pep Guardiola has adjusted to the Premier League quite quite significantly, actually, while retaining his core principles. So Vincent Company's growth as a manager depends on on being able to to learn these things. And I would say to pitch him into a job like Bayern now would be an incredible leap. Uh, what this season showed to me was he needs to, he needs another, maybe he needs a, 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 another season even at Burnley, but he certainly needs to to reassess where he is and, and come again with this coaching. But uh, as you as, as you outlined there, Duncan, Bayern Munich have gone from being the best run, best planned club in, in world football to to flailing around really in in the manner that um well we've we've, we've seen a, a a past incarnation of Manchester United or or or, or, a, or a past Chelsea maybe we'll see a present Chelsea do you know they they really don't this is not the Bayern Munich superpower um this is a this is a club that's in a real identity crisis um that's before you even talk about the squad which is a mess as well really so. Um, it'd be an incredible leap to put Vincent Company into that. Yeah, Luke, well, you make a very good point about Pep Guardiola's pragmatism and, and, and adaptability in the Premier League. And he's a manager who's gone from playing maybe the type of football that Company and others like De Zerbe sort of play almost religiously to putting out teams that have six centre backs in the lineup in a big number nine. Yeah, they're they're technically technically superbly good, but it, it's a combination of power and uh, and technical qualities. It's not just we're going to play it from the back and we're going to play nice football and we're going to beat everyone that way. Not at all, and 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 it's a it's a team that will will adapt to their opponents, you know. So against West Ham on the final day, Pep knows that he's going to face a team that will sit in and try and defend in a low block. So. He's able to play two number tens. He brings Foden inside and plays him with De Bruyne. But that's not what happens when he plays Arsenal or yeah. Liverpool. It's a different shape, and um, it's the same principles, but it's 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 tweaks. And what we didn't see from Vincent Company was any real 
um, adjustments being made. And part of being a manager at that top level is is finding ways to win those those really, really difficult games, you know. And, and I think if you look at company's record last season, it was more or less, I think they won two games against teams that weren't uh, fellow promotees. You know, two of the five victories came against the rest, but the other three came against Chef United uh, and, and Luton. So he wasn't, you know, he wasn't coping even with the, the, the Wolves and the Crystal Palaces of the league. And to put him in at Bayern, you have to beat Xabi Alonso, Alonso's Leverkusen and you have to win in the Champions League. Yeah, I, but I think you're right to highlight that he does have qualities and, and for sure Burnley right. don't want to lose him. And I, I can, I, I, other bit of information I have is that he is also uh, on the shortlist at Brighton and Hove Albion um, alongside Kieran McKenna, who is very much flavour of the month, just won League Manager of the Year as a Championship Manager. And, uh, and uh, amongst the other candidates are Liam Rossinier. Um, who, who this podcast in particular would love to see to return to the club where he began his coaching career. Now, in addition to Brighton, I understand that Chelsea are looking at company as a replacement for Pochettino. And this comes on the back of company being on their shortlist last year when they hired Pochettino. And I think possibly um, because Brighton are interested in him. And, uh, and we know that... Uh, that the, the owners at Chelsea love everything that Brighton are interested in. <laughs> there is that. Look, I, I, the, the, the situation with Chelsea, I think, sometimes misunderstood where people talk about Chelsea not having a plan um, and it just being a bunch of rich Americans, you know, shooting from the hip. That's not actually how it is. They do have a plan, but as you say, um, it's, it's a plan to emulate the best practice models as they see them out there. So Brighton is one of them and Red Bull is the other one. Um, Igbali, uh, Todd Bowley, Jose Feliciano um, have those clubs in mind when they're trying to build this model. They've appointed two sporting directors from those models. You know, Paul Wynn Stanley from Brighton, um, Lauren Stewart from the Red Bull model. And what they what what their idea is, and I think that's this is what lies behind the the Pochettino sacking is. It is very much to to be that club that runs heavily on data, so they want to build up the data department massively, and you know not just add a few people, but they've they've looked at what happens in American sports. The Dodgers, who who Todd Bowley co-owns, would have a data room, a research hub of about thirty to forty people, you know, and they think that that's an area of football where you can really add value because. Even the even the the, the the most sort of data led clubs wouldn't have departments anything like that big. A lot of the work that they've done, um, or the the sporting directors have done, has, and I think it's actually been quite sensible and impressive behind the scenes. So, for example, Chelsea, the Chelsea they inherited wasn't a joined up club by any means. It, 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 if you look at something like the loans department, Ch- you know, think think of Chelsea and their loans. They would stockpile players. They'd have. Someone like Lucas Piazon, who who spent goodness knows how many years at Chelsea, eleven different loans. There was no real sort of plan for that part of the club. They, the, the the loan players used to have a, a a loans group that they they trained in a separate group. They'd have a WhatsApp group to talk and 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 if you were, if you ended up in that loans group, it was always felt like being in in in, in a sort of limbo that you were, you were, you're no longer in the club, and there was a sense. There was no sort of plan for you, so I'm using that as an example of the, what they've then done. They've scrapped all that and they've they've, they've appointed a new loans manager, Josh Marsh from Chel- from Swansea, and they've tried to bring that into a more integrated um, way of thinking, integrating with recruitment and, and the first team. And I'm just using that as an example to try and say that there is a plan at Chelsea, and it is all about integrating the club. It's about being data led, and it's about um, but but what that means for the head coach is they just become a cog in the wheel. It's that model, it, it, and if, and that's what we see at Brighton. That's what we see at Red Bull. You're just a cog in the wheel of of this sort of club whose identity is set by the sporting directors and the executives. And ultimately, that's why Pochettino has gone really because he, as you as you 
said Duncan wanted had his own ideas about how the squad should look. Maybe needed want, wanted more experience, wanted a bit more influence over transfers. And after a season in which I think it had added incredible value by making sense of this huge unwieldy squad, um, make, getting a, a defined team, got to the end of the season and found that he was subject to a performance review which told him, you know, which metrics he was failing in. That's just not for Poch. And that's that's why he's ready to walk away. So then you think of why they'd be interested in somebody like Company. Well, it's because they're looking at a model where you have a head coach who you like the style of play, but they're not they're not powerful. You know, they're just that cog. Um and it'll be interesting um to see the, the you know, Kieran McKenna, I guess, might fit into that as well. A young coach who they think is gonna be playable. Um, and will fit will fit in with the model without wanting too much power. It'd be interesting to see, you know, the group of candidates they go for. But I, I suspect it will be all of that that sort of type, that younger coach who doesn't want to be a traditional manager and will fit with um, the kind of systems they've put in place. Well, other other coaches on the list are Enzo Maresca, who's just brought mm-hmm. Leicester City up, used to working in the academy system at Manchester City and. Highly, highly regarded there. Fulham's Marco Silva, who I understand has delayed his return to Portugal for his summer holiday. Stuttgart's Sebastian Honus. Girona's Mikel, um, part of the CFG group. And uh, Sporting's Ruben Amarin, who was recently interviewed for the West Ham job and lost out to Julian Lopetegui. Um, I, I take your point. Uh, about them, it's not the case that Chelsea don't have an idea. It's the question is whether the idea is right, and I, I think there's an argument yeah. to be had o- over whether, when you're Chelsea football club, you're used to competing for the Premier League and the Champions League, whether you want to emulate Brighton yeah. and a Red Bull, who are two of the you know the the best development clubs in European football, been very successful in making money, a good chunk of it off the guys who now own um, <laughs> Chelsea. So he, 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 I, there's a question about can you be a development club that spends a billion euros on transfers in, in a two-year period. But let, let's leave that for, a, for another day. Last bit of managerial news before we, we go on to Manchester United is that um, Jose Mourinho has turned down the opportunity to move to the Saudi Pro League. Um, he has been offered a post at Al Qadisa, um, who are owned by uh, the Saudi national oil company Aramco and have just been promoted into the Pro League. Um, I understand the salary was around 15 million euros tax free a season. Um, it is not the case, I'm told, that Mourinho is against moving to the Pro League. In fact, he's talked very positively about the Pro League a couple of times. and. In, in this past season, uh, particularly since losing his job at AS Roma. But he uh, would prefer one of the four PIF clubs at the top end of the league. Let's move on to Manchester United, uh, who have very much been one of the big stories of, of this Premier League season, uh, not in a good way for them. Um they are now in a period of, of radical change uh, with Ineos in charge and this, this kind of bizarre uh, relationship with the Glazers where they own 27.7% of the shares, um, obviously do not have majority control, but have been allowed to take control of the football side of the club and also recently to take charge of the key executive roles in the club. So we have um, Dave Brailsford, head of Ineos, Ineos Sport, coming in as as the Ratcliffe, Jim Ratcliffe's right-hand man and, and man on the ground at Carrington to lead the change. Um, Omar Barada, coming from Manchester City as chief executive. Dan Ashworth will eventually come from uh, Newcastle United as director of football once compensation can be sorted or perhaps if he's made to wait through a very long period of, of gardening leave. And uh, Jason Wilcox, being brought in from Southampton, previously of Manchester City, as the technical director. Um, you know, Johnny, I argued for a long time that one of the problems with, with Glazer's uh, ownership of the club is that they 
they failed to appoint best in class in the majority of key positions in the club. Do you think they have done that with this round of appointments? I think they've made really good appointments. It's hard to, it's hard to say best in class because there's actually now some outstanding sporting directors out there, for example, yeah. um, and heads of recruitment. Um, it's, a, it's always a bit difficult to kind of define exactly what a best in class football chief executive is as well because it's a it's a unique industry really if you're a chief exec isn't it where your sphere of influence isn't really on the core business which is what happens on the pitch uh, but anyway Omar Brada I've 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 listened to him give speeches at dinners I've I've met him he's an impressive guy he certainly came with a good reputation from Manchester City uh and a knowledge of what a top football club looks like internally and uh, a, a guy who can get deals done from from what I understand. Um, but, you know, clearly Manchester City's success is down more to a certain Pep Guardiola than any executive. Um, but they've done well there. Um, and I think, I, 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 I think, again, Jason Wilcox has a great reputation in the industry. Um, he, had, he hasn't really done the role that he's going into before on that scale has to be said he was Manchester City's academy but you know a, a, a guy that's very well rated um, and uh, what I could say though is that Dan Ashworth I think is a very good appointment for Manchester United at this time um, he almost pioneered sporting directorship in, in, in England if you think back to, to his work at West Brom and at the at the at the FA, um, oversaw a real long and profound culture change and systems change. Really updated um, England from from top to bottom, um, in in quite bold ways as well. But but bringing in um, a uniform culture, um, getting to work on development in a really coherent way. Having been quite involved in E Triple P, but but re, you know thinking through the real details of things, for example, like the I don't know the Victory Shield that that, that England used to play in, um, where the best sixteen year olds in the country would be thrown up against Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales live on TV. Great event, great event that 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 you know had a real history behind it, but. Um, that's the kind of detail that, that Dan looked at and thought, well, what does that mean if if our 16-year-old kids are in academies with Scottish, Welsh and Irish players? Why would we use up a valuable um, you know, chunk of contact time to put them on live TV as well where there's loads of pressure on them um, and just play against the same players? Why not scrap that and use that time to, to go, you know, play Brazil, play Japan, go around the world? And that was really revolutionary and people hated it but it was really successful and so on and I'm using that as an example of a guy that that that'll sort of isn't afraid to break tradition and will look at the details and I just think Manchester United need that more than anything um you have been writing about it for so long but they need somebody that can provide a, a, a absolutely coherent way of modernizing that football club from from training ground I know the academy is producing good players, but it, it 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 could do better in terms of 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 marrying up with the with the first team um, in terms of um, producing exactly the, the the profile of players that the the manager is looking for and all that kind of stuff. Certainly, the managerial appointment um, which has been made on the hoof um, in the last twelve years. Now there's a chance for them to um, have a, a sporting director in charge of it who can can marry that up with with the vision for the club. And I think Dan showed himself very capable of doing that with the appointment of Gareth Southgate, which again wasn't necessarily acclaimed with open arms, but has, has worked so well for England. And then transfers, you know, Dan 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 has has, has had a very good transfer record with West Brom in terms of finding value at the bottom end. But fast forward to his more recent work at Newcastle, um, I think upgraded that squad pretty cleverly with the the money available. 
So I I see that as a I see that as a more or less best in class appointment for sure. Um, and the th- only thing I can't get my head around is why they don't just pay the money and get them out of Newcastle. It's 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 slightly ridiculous that you know they're, they're sitting there waiting for him um, for the sake of a couple of million quid. It is, it is such an important time for Manchester United, and, and as you've identified, Dan Ashworth is is central in this process. He, he's a close relationship with Dave Brailsford. He's one of the first guys that they brought into this system. Mm. Um, we won't mention Sandro Tonali, uh, but generally in his transfer business <laughs> has been very good. But the, the transfer business is going to be fundamental to to this uh, rebuild of Manchester United, and they're in a difficult position as as most Premier League clubs are these days, um, being hampered by uh, the Premier League's profit and sustainability rules, which which prevents uh, Ineos from just coming in and saying, OK, here's 300 million um, to build a new team and, and, and to help get rid of the players that, that we don't think are good enough at present. I should mention now again, I mentioned at the, the start of the programme that you just completed in, in, I think, record time a new book huh. on uh, on Dan Ashworth in part, um, but primarily, I think, on Gareth Southgate um, called Dear England, the real story behind the Three Lions rebirth, written with the Guardian's Rob Draper. And um, I, 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 I'll first ask you how you feel about having your name. Um, put on the front of a book with the title Dear England <laughs> well I didn't think at the start of my career that I'd ever have my name not only on a on a, on a book that's got England in the title but it's got a, a flag of St George waving around in the background but I'm really I'm really it's not actually record time for me I've written quicker books by the way but that's, okay. my, that's wow. probably my mad working the less the book but that's my mad working patterns um look it's yeah, first of all, thanks for thanks for mentioning it. it, it it's um, it's a story really of, um, in fact, not just not just Southgate, not just Ashworth, but their key figures, but really the rebirth of of English football over in, English national football over the last um, eight years. Uh, going back to, I mean, I've I've covered the English national team actually going back to Euro '96 when I worked in the Scottish press and and was given England as a as a kind of pet subject, but as a punishment. <laughs> it was a punishment at Euro '96. Don't, don't, yeah, <laughs> don't believe me. That was that was tough. But um, re- really, the first part of my career down south um, involved covering that England under first of all uh, Sven Goran Eriksson, and then Fabio Capello, and then Roy Hodgson, and briefly Sam. I'll have a pint of wine, Allardyce. Um, <laughs> that was, I mean, frankly. A soap opera, um, a soap opera with some stellar footballers involved, but a team that 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 consistently underperformed at tournaments, that had divides in the camp, and that just wasn't a coherent product on the football pitch, uh, tactically, uh, and 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 wasn't coherent culturally, and had, you know, the press at odds with the team, had um, had supporters who seemed very much rooted in a kind of old football fan culture that we, we you know at times was was difficult to to witness and it's taken for granted now and that's 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 what happens with change but this the england that we see now is so fundamentally different to the one i used to cover when it from 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 the players in the squad from from a group of footballers that are young really talented there's an emphasis on attack uh, there's an emphasis on ball playing um, and, and expression from um, an FA that's now, I think, got the more or less the best sort of development plan for bringing players through the system, and that's shown by success at junior level and players going all the way into the, the senior team. Starting with, let's say, a 13-year-old Jude Bellingham turning up at St George's Park for his first training camps, you know, and his journey, or, or, or a 14-year-old Phil Foden. I mean, England have become world leaders and all of that and then a manager who may divide opinion still um because i think everyone always wants more from the england manager but certainly is the most skilled communicator i've seen in that job by an absolute mile 
um, someone that's got huge human qualities um, that that's um, managed to connect with uh, a, a young group of players, players from different backgrounds, and um, really sort of change, I suppose, the vibe of England away from being this kind of tub thumping. Um, 12 German bombers plant the flag sort of um, uh, you know blood on the shirt type team to something that's that's sort of quite modern and appealing even for a Scot to witness so it's been a it's been a huge journey over eight years and it was actually just fun chronicling it because you realize how much has happened um, and there's been downs in the story as well as ups you know you, there was there was a point um, where Gareth Southgate very nearly walked away from the England job after being um, humiliated 4-0 by, by Hungary at Molyneux and fans singing you don't know what you're doing as he came off the pitch. You were very yeah. close to the brink at that yeah. point. So it's not just been a straight line story. There's been lots of ups and downs and I think they are now in a fascinating state going into the Euros where they're one of the favourites but they're still um, in in the territory of of of... of Sort of there being questions around them, and um, it, it 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 feels a very unfinished story. I don't know what's going to come next, but it felt writing the book that um, it was great to write about the journey, and and there will be an update after the after the championships in the summer. I yeah, I'm 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 fascinated to read that book because I know with you and Rob doing it, it's going to be a, a real education and and done with great detail. Um, mm-hmm. And I agree with you that this this England team is clearly more talented than anything they've ever had before. Um, and, and I guess that's where you come back to the question about Southgate, which you alluded to. Um, how much of his quality is that creation of a group and handling individuals uh, compared to his technical ability and tactical decisions within games um, and let's bring this back to Manchester United um, I understand that Southgate is one of the strong candidates for the Manchester United job if Ineos decide to change Eric Ten Hag after the FA Cup final this weekend other candidates are Maurizio Pochettino and, uh, and Graham Potter and I think there is a, a a common thread that runs through those three coaches that mm-hmm. all of them are known for their ability to develop players. Um, have, knowing Southgate as well as you do and having, having done this extensive recent study on him, do you think that's a, a natural fit to, to turn Manchester United around? I do. I really, I really do. I think there's a lot of logic in it, um, and I'll explain why. Look, to, to start with, the kind of the, the 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 common criticism of Southgate, which is tactically he's not at the top level, quote unquote. Um, first of all, I'm not. I'm not so sure about that. I have to say, um, I think there's been a growth in 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 Southgate's management on that score, and and I go back to um, really what we're talking about is a is is a team that's. Got to the first FA, got to the first World Cup semi final since 1990, which is a pretty decent effort. Um, but were beat, but had but had shortcomings because they had a three five two system that against an absolutely top Croatian midfield um, was 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 outmaneuvered and unpicked, and um, that was that was a, a day when when Gareth probably hit a, hit a bit of a ceiling, but maybe it was just a group of players that ultimately didn't have the quality in the key area. But, okay, you could say got to World Cup semi-final, but, okay. Then you're talking about the getting to the final of the Euros at home. And England haven't been in the European Championship final before. It, it, you know, we're not talking about a nation that... We're not talking about Germany or um, Italy. England are not a winning nation and that's my point about Gareth. He can't be that bad tactically if he's got them closer than anyone since Alf Ramsey to actually win in something. And yes, again, you could unpick that game and say uh, they were outmaneuvered in midfield, that Roberto Mancini did a couple of things like um, pushing pushing Cialini forward that Gareth didn't respond to, blah, blah, blah. Okay. 
But you're looking for development. In the 2022 World Cup, England were, England were excellent and went out to a France team who are basically the Real Madrid of international football, who've got a habit of <laughs> playing against you. You're not quite sure how. You think you're dominating the game and they beat you. They do it to nearly everyone. They couldn't do it to Messi, but they very nearly did, even in the World Cup final. And England were the better side in that in that game. And Harry Kane missed a penalty in in in, in the final minutes. They would have taken it to extra time. The French Hugo Lloris himself said um, that they'd have won it in extra time. They were stronger in the game at that point than we were. So I I think the idea that Gareth Southgate's this limited manager is flawed to start with. I don't I don't think he's a tactical dunce as as, as his critics want to say. I think he's pretty good. I would I would say that yes, Pep Guardiola on that score might be better. Mikel Arteta might be ahead, but I think there's room for Gareth to grow. He's only actually managed 250 games in his career because that's what happens when you're an international okay. manager. You don't actually build that experience. So I think there's room to grow there. I think the pluses are things that I've talked about in terms of building um, a culture, developing players, changing a mood. That applies to Pochettino as well, by the way. That was his work at Chelsea and that was his work at Spurs. And he's incredibly good on that score. And that is why that is what Manchester United need. Uh, unless they could somehow get Pep Guardiola, they're going to have to do it a different way. And I think they're so far behind those really top clubs at this moment in time that they need a process. Mikel Arteta took four years to get Arsenal to this point. Jurgen Klopp took, was it four years to win a trophy? Three and a half yeah. at, at Liverpool. So United need to accept that. They need to accept the journey and they need somebody who can affect fundamental change, develop players, in instill a proper culture. How bad's Manchester United's culture been recently in terms of player behaviour and, you know, the, some people trying, some people not. That's what they fundamentally need. And in terms of who's out there, um, I think Gareth Southgate's shown all those qualities um, in his national team job and has room to grow tactically. And 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 Pochettino makes sense on that score as well. So to put you on the spot, one, would you get rid of Eric, Eric Ten Hag? And two, would Gareth Southgate be your first choice if you had the full universe of coaches to, to choose? Well, oh, that's a... Oh, I mean, <laughs> look, <laughs> look... I, I, I think Eric Ten Hag's gone backwards this year and, and, and I, 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 I don't, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see it changing. So yes to your first bit. Um, the full universe of coaches, no, I'd, I'd appoint Pep Guardiola. But in, if we're dealing with who's out there... Full the, universe the, of attainable coaches. Of attainable three coaches. Three. So the drawback in Gareth in that score is that He's not going to make any decisions until after the European Championships. He is not like he's not Julian Lopetegui who agreed to be Real Madrid manager while taking Spain to a World Cup. He is not that guy. So if they want him, they would have to wait, and there's no guarantees um, even then. So that's that's a predicament of of appointing Gareth. I'm, I have to mention as well that that he's also Gareth not only worked with Dan Ashworth but is is a friend of Dave Brailsford. Is quite yeah. close to Dave Brailsford. Who's been on study visits to America uh, with a, with a group of sports coaches, including Dave Brailsford. So there's a synergy there. But if they want somebody right now, then they would have to point someone else. That's just the fact of it. And sometimes in football, you have to you have to make you have to act um, there and then, and and you can't wait. And I think that's the that's the dilemma that Manchester United are in right now. Let's move across the northwest of England uh, to Liverpool um, and to Arnie Slot, who I'm I'm delighted to say enters the uh, the storied panoply of elite bald coaches in the Premier League. Oh. We're we're getting there. We'll have all Duncan, six. And... Have you noticed how many elite referees are bald? By the way, or maybe maybe bad referees. Some would say, but there's a lot of bald referees out there. I don't know what that means for us. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it, maybe maybe there's too much thinking going up for the, <laughs> the, the referees and the, and the coaches, but but it is becoming quite a pattern. 
tell Indeed. tell us a, tell us about Arnie Slot. Um, why Liverpool went for him after failing to to get hold of Xabi Alonso, and is this a is this a smarter fit to the change that Liverpool have to go through having lost Jurgen Klopp um, than than it seemed to be on the surface when you see Liverpool very rapidly appointing a coach from the Dutch league, albeit an accomplished coach from the Dutch league. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I think, I think it's smart. I actually, I really do. Look, the, 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 the downside is, is the, is your last point that, that there hasn't been a successful Dutch coach in English football. Not really. I suppose you could say Goose Hiddink, but, but he was only ever here on interim. Basis. For short periods, yeah. For short period, Koeman did okay. My good friend Martin Yolls probably, I'm a big Martin fan, probably has done as well as anybody, did an excellent job at Spurs. But the gulf between that league and, and, and the Premier League has, has proved too much for a lot of coaches to bridge. That's a drawback. But Arnie Slot, I'm told, is just a bit different to the, the normal template of the Dutch coach, which tends to be quite strong-willed and dogmatic that he's a really charismatic person, he's a really bright person and, and, and capable of, of adapting, is, as it was put to me, you know, his communication is off the skill. It's, I, uh, one of my contacts said that I've never heard a Dutch coach speak such good English, um, you know, and, and that's important because if you think of the Liverpool job as Jurgen Klopp defined it, communication to the, the wider fan base and and inspiring of, of people is actually part of part of the the fabric of that that job and I think he'll do that really well plays really front foot dynamic football really intense high pressing regains high up the pitch all that kind of stuff which which follows on quite logically from Klopp's um football I, I, he's got an excellent record with player availability injuries and so on which I think is come into the thinking um, and an excellent record in in adding value um, to 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 players and to squads, um, which you know we know Liverpool have got quite a set model, um, and Michael Edwards is back now um, yeah. with Richard Hughes coming in, uh, and that model will go further down the route of of um, you know data and looking for value signings rather than Galacticos, and they need a coach to fit within that. So. I think all all of that bundled up together makes this um, a pretty logical appointment. And also, I think just because of who Arnie Slot is as a person and uh, from the football final would have played, it's what you know. Jurgen Klopp leaving is such a huge thing for for that football club, and yet there's actually a mood of excitement among the fan base because of what's coming next, and that's been really hard to to pull off. Clearly, Xabi Alonso, but you know that flies as you say to Bayern, would have been the the ideal. But I I think they've done pretty well in in slot coming in. Um, but we'll see, we'll see. The, 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 there is that nagging thing at the back of your mind that the, the gulf between Holland and England. That's that's my only real big worry about it. Yeah, he's won one Dutch title in his three years at Feyenoord. Finished, finished third. And and second the other seasons, um, he but Feyenoord aren't a club that regularly win the Dutch title. Uh, made the Europa Conference League final and lost to Jose Mourinho's Roma in 2022. Won the Dutch Cup this year and and played as you say very good football. And if anything, that that on a statistical basis, and we and as you've mentioned, Liverpool are very into statistics. They improved this season. Uh, they certainly paid a significant amount of money for him. I, I understand that the amount that Feyenoord director, uh, Dennis De Closer, extracted from Liverpool after they'd contacted Slot without um, requesting permission to speak to him is, is considerably more than the €11 million Euros that was reported in England. Um, and I think, I think it tells us quite a lot about the actually radical changes behind the scenes at Liverpool because it's not just Jurgen Klopp leaving. As you've identified, Michael Edwards has come back having left because to a certain extent he couldn't do what he wanted to do with Klopp in charge. So he's now chief executive of, of Fenway Sports Group for football. He's brought Richard Hughes in from Bournemouth. 
He's brought Julian Ward back as FSG technical director. And and this was a v- extremely data-led approach to hiring a coach. So I do think it's interesting in, in what it tells us about how FSG want to run the club. Now they've lost the guy who got them back to the top. Yeah, and also... I mean, Arnie Slot comes in as head coach and not as manager. Yes, good and that, point. And that's a sh- that's a shift, and that's that tells you um, another another sort of layer as to what they're thinking. And it almost brings us back to talking about when we're talking about Chelsea. This is the era of of executives and sporting directors running the show, and not necessarily of managers. And you know, Klopp did actually come in from that model, but grew in power over time, grew in influence over time. And it's a, it, it's a return to, um, it's a return to what I think has instinctively always been the way that FSG have wanted to operate, um, you know, Moneyball, data-led and um, with executives in charge. But I'm also told that Arnie Slot is, is, is perfectly happy with that. It's yeah. all he's ever known. He's actually come from before Feyenoord, quite a small Dutch club. He's not he's not a big ego merchant. He doesn't expect to be wandering around with a big important title. He wants to coach and um and that's also you know, they know all that. That's also part of his attraction. Yeah, one one a little aside on on the, the data led approach, one of the things that happened under Jurgen Klopp in his second last season, which was the season of, of multiple injuries, was that Klopp stopped using a, uh, uh, a an AI-led um, analysis of players' uh, physical output on in the field and training, which which was designed to flag up whether players were likely to get injured or not. Um, and, I, and I understand that caused a fair amount of discontent within mm. the backgrounds backroom staff at Liverpool because they felt the system had been working well and it got overrode by Klopp. So this is an, this is an opportunity in, in bringing a coach in who they have specifically targeted to fit the way they want to work um, for them to do something different. But also a big, a big, big test of, of whether that handing everything over to the, the scientists works or not. Yeah, it is. I mean... Brendan Rodgers actually back in the day ended up going pretty much because he couldn't work with with Edwards and the model. So, you know, there's an element of of, of going back to that. But um they're not, not Michael Edwards is nothing if not self confident and nothing if not successful. Um and will have no doubts that this is gonna work and that, that his recruitment will work and that the systems that, that he and Richard Hughes are will put in place will work as well um and to you know i'm huge i'm a huge michael edwards fan and 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 i think his self confidence is pretty justified the only thing that fascinates me is that this has just come after a year in which jürgen klopp has i think put on a bit of a masterclass of old fashioned management to extract that performance that he did out of a a very transitional squad to go pretty deep into that title race and to pull a few rabbits out of the hat in the transfer market, you know, notably with Taro Endo, an old-fashioned signing, which is really the manager um, plucking someone out of, of, of a football that he knew. Um, it's just fascinating that the, all this, this this has come after Klopp's given us a year of um, actually this is what an old-fashioned manager can can do. But, um, but as I say, Arnie Slot will will uh, be perfectly comfortable, I think, working with uh, the systems that they put in him from. Because what his interest is in is is coaching, coaching, coaching. So, so we talked about the, this kind of super organisation of Liverpool. Um, I think we should finish up by talking about the most organised club in in the Premier League. And and their their organisational ability extends way beyond to the football pitch to to the political domain. I think, and it, and it's Manchester City, um, who, not Sheffield who are, United, 
No, Sheffield United, <laughs> despite despite their ownership um, from a from a similar area of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, we have Manchester City just become the first English club ever in what over 130 years of of top flight football to win four titles in a row. Um, they've won six of the last seven. They are averaging 93 points per season over the last four campaigns. Uh, a level that only Chelsea and Liverpool twice have ever surpassed in all the Premier League campaigns put together. Um, they had just won a couple more statistics, past completion levels of 90.5%, the best player availability rates of all the uh, the English Champions League clubs and the, the fifth best overall. And, and I'll put a little aside in here, especially for you, uh, Jonathan, that the best player availability in the league this year was from West Ham playing European yep. football. Your, it's your friend David Moyes. Good man. Unfairly, unfairly dismissed. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but, and this is the big but, and I don't think we can ignore this. These titles have come in a period in which Manchester City have been investigated for breaching the fundamental rules of trading players uh, in uh, domestic and European football since 2018 by the Premier League evidence that, that's gone out into the public domain that um, that UEFA found them guilty of breaking FFP rules and had that reversed um, subsequently by a majority verdict in a, from a three-person commission. They're winning in a season where we've seen two very prominent clubs got hit with uh, points penalties for breaking Premier League rules more recently. Where does where does it leave English football and, and what kind of problem does Premier League have from an image perspective when you've got this unprecedented performance on the field but these big question marks raised by the competition organisers themselves, they're the guys charging Manchester City about whether they've followed the rules? Well, I mean, the, the absence of Richard Masters from the... Etihad on on Sunday was interesting. Um, he was at he was at the Emirates, and um, uh, someone else presented the trophy to Manchester City. So that 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 I mean, Mr. Master said there was nothing scientific about it. He, he had to choose one or the other, but it felt it felt intriguing given that the Masters also said recently that the the the, the date for hearing this. Um, these charges finally the case was was in the near future although he wouldn't expand on what that was um the thing that's really struck me is that the 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 damage or the the question marks about what this means have actually intensified rather than receded over the passage of time the more that manchester city win the more that people want to ask these questions and that is bad for the league and I think it's bad for Manchester City. And the you know the the point here would be that that they need to have this case heard as much as any as anything. Um, they need to um, put this case to bed. Surely these charges to bed. But if they're as innocent as they 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 say they maintain, they absolutely maintain they are, and um, that there's an agenda against them, and that they will they will win when they have their day in court and that that's that's that that to me is the 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 the, the thing i find odd about this situation shall we say it's you know why not why don't city just let's go to court go go to the process i think i think their argument would be um that you know they see this as, as such an egregious um situation that they are the victims of, of an agenda against them and that you know, you, you, you when you're innocent, you should challenge a process that's working against you. I think that's where they're coming from. I, I do get that, but it surely it'd be better to have this have this case heard and clear their name. Yeah, if you if you're absolutely confident that you haven't broken any of the rules and you say that it's unfair that you're being challenged, the logical thing, as you say, would be to get it out of the way. And thirty five of these Premier League charges are for a failure to cooperate with Premier League investigations. The Manchester City have gone to the UK courts 
to challenge the right of yeah. the Premier League to to make judgment on them. So they're, they're actually going in the opposite direction. They, they, okay, we can't say they've taken every possible step to avoid being um, uh, prosecuted. Maybe they've no, they avoided haven't. some, but they have taken a lot of steps to avoid being prosecuted, and and. And it's damaging for the Premier League, and 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 I think I think you're correct. It's damaging for their image. It is. Look, it has to be reiterated that Manchester City say they're absolutely innocent of all of these charges, including failing to cooperate, um, and that there's been you know a, a politically mo- motivated agenda against them. So it has to be stated, and it also has to be stated that the Premier League themselves, you know, we shouldn't portray this as. Um, this incredible, sleek, um, <laughs> you know, sort of dynamic organisation who are just being held up by a football club. I mean, man, the, the Premier League, as we've seen over the Everton case, have been a mess in terms of um, process, in terms of um, rule book and, 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 and application of, 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 of their own rules. So um, I think that, again, would be part of the Manchester City argument that... Um, you know, the, 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 this, the, 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 if there's, there's issues and it's the Premier League's issue as much as theirs, but we've kind of gone past this. Look, this is an out, as you said at the top of this, this is a, almost the best run football club we've ever seen from best coached, certainly. And when I say best run, I know people will be like screaming, yeah, but because of, but if you're talking about just things like recruitment, I know they've got money, but my goodness, they spend it well. Yeah. You know, academy. Yes, they pump money into the academy, but my goodness, they develop players well. Um, Multi club model. We might not like it, but my goodness, they execute it well. This is a a really well run football club, and it's a brilliantly coached football club with brilliant players. Um, and and you know, it's just n- not good from a a pure football fan point of view that you can't fully. Um, Look at it without thinking about these charges that are still hanging in the background. Yeah, and they were found guilty even by CAS of uh, breaching FFP regulations, albeit the, the two year ban was lifted and the fine reduced to 10 million euros in that judgment, which I think is something is forgotten by a lot of Manchester City fans. Um, if it does come to them being found guilty uh, by the independent commission, what should the punishment be? Because there are a full range of options. There's uh, fines, could be fines, could be point penalties. It could be ex- an expulsion from the Premier League. They've, if they're found guilty, they will certainly have be seen to have inflicted huge legal, administrative and reputational costs on the Premier League. Um, it's almost a second problem for for the league, isn't it? It's yeah. one one, prosecute. Two, have the independent commission come to decision. And then three, uh, what's the right set of penalties to be applied in, in a circumstance like this, if they are guilty? Yeah, and, and, and one of the problems we, we saw with the Everton case is exactly this, that um, they they sort of made up the, 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 the punishment after finding them guilty, or rather they recommended the punishment at the same time as recommending their guilt. Yes. That doesn't... You, 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 what you, 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 it disquiets me that there isn't already mapped out a tariff for for various offences, because then we'd have a much better idea of, of where we stand, um, or where we should stand on something like this. I would, I would suggest that um, points penalties and um, financial penalties have always been the way of dealing with with breaches. Um, and that that should be the first instance of uh, that they should look at if if they're guilty. I have to say it's a big if. Um, of course, I have I have my doubts. To, but by the way, as to whether they they will be found guilty because of the difficulties involved and and because of how strong they think some of their arguments are. But anyway, um, I um, my, my instinct is that that. For that they they would they would need to go down the financial and, and points penalty route, but but the consequences of that might be that would almost certainly be relegation anyway. Um, I don't know. I find I, 
I want I'd want to see what the what Manchester City were guilty of, if anything, really, before saying there should be anything like expulsions or whatever. But I mean, you know, clearly if you're gonna do Everton for the amount of points um that they were done for for, for breaching by nineteen million pounds PSR, then you'd think the points penalties involved in, in having these hundred and fifteen charges would be enormous, absolutely enormous. Um, and then the question would be, would those points penalties then carry into the Football League if they were relegated? Um, I don't know. Would- well, we, we saw we saw Pep Guardiola um, after winning that fourth consecutive title talking about what the next challenge could be mm. and that, how he needs something to motivate himself. So maybe maybe there's a win-win here in that but- the, uh, the Premier League give them 15-point penalty a season and, and Pep Guardiola <laughs> has a... Has a new, a new a handicap and a new incentive to to yeah. go and do something and breast it again. Here's a, here's a question that don't, I mean, what if Manchester City are cleared? Do they press a claim against the Premier League? You know, I, I think I think that would be a very real danger to the league, and I think a very real prospect. Manchester City could say you've you've abs- by by this fault you know, this process has been unfair and has 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 been damaging for us and and we need to be compensated I'd, I just find this this is this is a such a critical point either way for the for the league and for that club I I agree with you I think it's it's the it's not this just the case of Manchester City in this specific um charge and prosecution it's that we have a league in general that's because yeah. because uh PSR rules have gone from being something that was almost an afterthought to something which uh, limits the ability of most clubs in the transfer market. And we've had two clubs this season. Fortunately, neither of them ended up being relegated, but two clubs penalised. Yeah. Everyone's aware of it. And and we have moved, you know, with this on top of uh, video-assisted refereeing, we've moved away from the game being decided purely on the field, which it was for a century um, to it being decided in in a in a video suite um, and <laughs> and in, in courtrooms and, and then then there's a question that all but the 35 charges that you mentioned about the failure to com- cooperate with investigations all but those 35 of the 115 are actually from 2009 to 2018 which um Ignores most of the Pep Guardiola reign and most of the accrual of, of of titles as well. So, this idea of stripping them of all their titles that's complex as well. If 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 even if they were found guilty of all of these, um, it just it's just such an enormously messy and complex situation. Yeah, uh, obviously it was outside the title winning period, but the kind of yeah. argument is this: this was the period yeah. in which they built the machine and which yeah. they the they injected extra capital in to allow them to and I agree with you totally on the quality of the way the pure way in which if you're talking about the way in which they have used the resources available to them yeah. efficiently to yeah. turn themselves into the most effective club in it definitely in English football. I think there's an argument de- there's still an argument over European football, but definitely in English football. Um they have been without a parallel. They've got all of that stuff right. And they're they're mm. it's been a clever process because they came in, they bought the club, they they stuck with the people who were incumbents and they allowed them to demonstrate whether they were good enough or not. And they gradually replaced them. And they've they did what uh what I think any of us are trying to do now with Manchester United, which is replace each individual with best in class and and gradually build a model for dominance. And a joined up model, you know, we've been talking a lot yes. about this, a, a, a model where chief exec, sporting director and head coach or manager are, are absolutely 100% on the same page. And look, I, I know there are critics of Manchester City who say that because of all this, they switch off the TV or whatever. I, I'm absolutely not one of those. I, I find there's a lot to admire and enjoy about Manchester City, the football, the the players they produce, um, it, 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 the team that the team that they have, uh, the cleverness of a lot of stuff. I mean, there's so much 
to admire and and you know i i hope I, if i'm you know got instinct i i hope i hope that i actually hope they're found innocent that they they are innocent i hope they are innocent not that i suppose <laughs> that's the that's the thing i just hope but i hope i hope that what we're watching isn't the result of of of, of rule breaking um and I hope that you can just sort of put that aside and say, yeah, this is, this is amazing. To finish up the podcast, um, I'm going to ask you for a hero of the Premier League season. Oh, well, it's, I think it's Unai Emery for me. Um, maybe a, uh, Maybe it's natural to get kind of coloured by interviews that you do, but I I had a an hour with Unai um, back in October. Uh, I just I came away almost yeah almost wanting to get my kit on and start running around on a wet November day at Bodymore because he's the man's so charismatic and intense and inspirational and um, driven and has a way of projecting that drive and and that was. Early in the season, but an insight to me into what how what his personality is and what his um, ambition is, and how that has absolutely if infused and empowered a football club, and that's been one of the biggest stories, transformation stories that we've seen in the last couple of years. Villa from relegation threatened, winning two and eleven under Gerard before he went to a team that's now in the Champions League. Um, yeah, who develops players, thrilling to watch, and um, they've got this sort of brooding, intense, super talented manager who who you know has his own comeback story, given what happened to him at Arsenal. So I love Unai Emery, and and I think he's been a breath of fresh air for the the Premier League. Villain, villain of the season for me, uh, video assistant refereeing. I don't think we need <laughs> to say any more. Jonathan Northcroft, thank you so much for joining us on the Transfers podcast. Uh, We look forward to your new book, uh, Dear England, and we'll hopefully have you back on the podcast before the the summer window is concluded. My pleasure. Enjoyed that, Duncan, and and all the best for for, for the podding ahead. Thank you. You've been listening to the Transfers podcast powered by footballtransfers.com. Please, please, please subscribe to our new feed on your preferred podcast platform. Rate us, review us, and even tell your friends. You can follow us and message us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Transfers Podcast. And you can follow us on Twitter at Transfers Cast. And if you're a real glutton for punishment, you can follow me at Duncan Castles. Our music and production is by Mark Caulfield at Pro Podcast Production. We'll be back next week. Stay safe, be well, and thank you for listening.